Hi, this is Nate, and today we are going to be reading Chapter 19, A Man and His Times. I was born a slave on a plantation in Franklin County, Virginia. I am not quite sure of the exact place or exact date of my birth, but at any rate, I suspect I must have been born somewhere and at some time. So begins the autobiography of Booker T. Washington, who was born five years before the Civil War began. By the end of the 19th century, he was one of the best-known men, black or white, in America. Here is more of the autobiography. My life had its beginnings in the midst of the most miserable, desolate, and discouraging surroundings. This was so, however, not because my owners were especially cruel, for they were not, as compared with many others. I was born in a typical log cabin, about 14 by 16 feet square. In this cabin, I lived with my mother and a brother and sister till after the Civil War, when we were all declared free. The little cabin where Booker lived was also the plantation kitchen. His mother was the plantation cook. Cooking was done in an open fireplace. The family slept on the dirt floor, on bundles of rags. I was asked not long ago to tell something about the sports and pastimes that I engaged in during my youth. Until that question was asked, it had never occurred to me that there was no period of my life that was devoted to play. From the time that I can remember anything, almost every day of my life has been occupied in some kind of labor. Though I think I would now be a more useful man if I had had time for sports. Booker T. Washington became a useful man anyway. He was 10 when the Civil War ended, and his mother moved her small family to West Virginia. Booker went to work in a salt furnace, but his mother was determined that he get an education. He wanted to go to school, too. And over here we have a picture, and as Captain says, Booker T. Washington, educator, author, orator, and political leader. I had no schooling whatever while I was a slave. Though I remember on several occasions I went as far as the schoolhouse door with one of my young mistresses, mistresses to carry her books. The picture of several dozen boys and girls in a classroom engaged in study made a deep impression upon me, and I had the feeling that to get into a schoolhouse and study in this way would be about the same as getting into paradise. Getting into paradise wasn't easy. Booker's family needed the money he earned. He watched other black children going to school, and he ached to go too. Finally, he found a way. He got up early, worked until school began, went to school, and then went back to work. Then someone told Booker Washington about a Negro college in Hampton, Virginia. He decided that was where he wanted to go. He didn't know anyone there, or if they would accept him. He just headed east until he got to Hampton. It was 500 miles. He arrived with without any money, and got a job as a janitor to pay for his studies. Hampton Institute provided vocational training for blacks. That means it taught students to be farmers, carpenters, teachers, brickmakers, or to do other useful jobs. Students learned skills and to take pride in their work. After the Civil War in the South, few people wanted to work hard. Many blacks thought hard work was slaves' work, and they didn't want to re be reminded of slavery. Whites didn't want to work hard either. They had always had slaves to do that, so no one valued hard work. Up here we have a picture, and it's Catherine says, Students at the Hampton Institute learn mechanical drawing. The teachers at the Institute, who were mostly northern whites, understood that people who work hard get things done and feel good about their accomplishments. At Hampton, teachers worked right along with students. Booker T. Washington was one of the best of those students. So when the president of Hampton, Hampton Institute was asked to recommend someone to head a new training institute for blacks at Tuskegee, Alabama, he suggested Booker T. Washington for the job. Aside from that recommendation, the people at Tuskegee didn't know much about him. They were expecting a white man to head the school. Washington was expecting a building and all the necessary apparatus ready for me to begin teaching. They were both surprised. What Washington found at Tuskegee in June of 1881 
was one building and an old church. This is how he described the schoolhouse. This building was in such poor repair that, whenever it rained, one of the older students would, be, would ki very kindly leave his lessons and hold an umbrella over me while I heard the recitations of the others. Up here I have a picture, and this caption says, A lab at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And down here we have Agricultural Revolutionary. George Washington Carver was one of America's great scientists. Carver sparked an agricultural revolution in the American South urging farmers to change from soil-exhausting crops like cotton and Tabasco to those such as peanuts and sweet potatoes, which fed people and the soil too. He couldn't bear to waste things, and that led him to develop more than 400 synthetic materials from common crops and agricultural leftovers, cheese, dyes, even synthetic marble. When Booker T. Washington invited him to Tuskegee, Carver found a home, adding prestige to that university. And we have a picture to go to it. It says, George Washington Carver discovered hundreds of uses for peanuts. Washington rolled up his sleeves and went to work. He and his students cut down trees, cleared lands, dug wells, and built buildings. By 1900, Tuskegee had 40 buildings and some fine teachers. Booker T. Washington was renowned as the voice of the black people. He was quite a speaker. He spoke so well that he often left audiences cheering. Contributions poured into Tuskegee Institute. The school's graduates went out and trained others. Booker T. Washington was a wonderful speaker, but in his speeches he urged blacks to work hard and not agitate for civil rights. He said that blacks must first gain economic freedom by learning working skills and getting good jobs. Then they could battle for other kinds of freedom. Washington became a national hero. But some blacks weren't happy with just economic freedom. They were American citizens. They wanted to vote, to ride on buses with everyone else, and to go to the same schools. They wanted to send lynchers to jail and kill Jim Crow. One man began to criticize Booker T. Washington's style of leadership, and that shocked a lot of people. Up here we have a statue, and its caption says, Booker T. Washington is honored with a statue at Tuskegee Institute titled, Lifting the Veil of I Ignorance. He said, a race like an individual lifts itself up by lifting others up. And over here we have a picture, its caption says, Washington urged blacks to work hard and not agitate for civil rights. So that was chapter 19. I hope you all have a great day.